Good afternoon. This is May 20th, 2020, and I'm Larry Ripka, the CEO of the Bellmark Financial Group. We're recording this for our member firms to give them an update on what's going on with the U.S. life industry now that we have first quarter earnings in and insurance companies are starting to report their results. Uh, life insurance companies are certainly impacted by this COVID crisis and particularly with bonds and mortgages. We're going to be talking about that today. A huge part of what we call life insurance 10x is selecting the right companies and knowing about how they are doing financially through this is a big part of how we can help add value to the clients that are considering buying life insurance. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about what we can see and what we can't see and some things that we are measuring as part of our star rankings at Valmark in terms of assessing the carriers we're doing business with. So with that, let's uh, get started. When I say that the U.S. life insurance companies are impacted, one quantifiable way of measuring that is looking at the share prices of the publicly traded life insurance companies relative to the market. So what I've done here is I've graphed the S&P 500, which is in black, versus uh, four life insurance companies that we have as core carriers at Valmark. We have Lincoln in the blue. We have Principal Financial Group in the pink. We have Manulife or John Hancock in green and Pru represented by purple. And as you can see, that uh, while the market as a whole is down about 13%, these U.S. life companies are down 39 to almost 50%. And this is uh, very similar to other U.S. publicly traded companies. Actually, some of the annuity writers have taken a bigger hit. So investors are looking at what's going on with these companies what is their ability to continue to pay dividends or have increased earnings? And they are discounting the life insurance writer's shares as, as stocks. So that's something that we can see. It's measurable. Now, let's put this in perspective. Um, having a stock that's down 50%, that, that's as much a drop as the Ford Motor Company or Hilton Hotels. So investors are saying that Life insurance companies are impacted, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. A lot of it is because what life insurance companies own. Life insurance companies are financial intermediaries, and they buy mainly bonds and mortgages. They repackage those in financial products, whether it's an annuity or a term insurance policy or a universal life policy with secondary guarantees. So we can see from this graph that 72%, this is the top 100 life insurance companies, of what they have on their balance sheet as assets are bonds. And also the second biggest category is mortgages. Now when we take that into uh, those two categories along with cash and policy loans, we're looking at something like 85 to 90% of life insurance companies' assets are in fixed instruments. And we're going to look a little bit more at what's happened with those fixed instruments in the financial crisis. Now, Valmark carriers specifically, um, we've looked at mortgages because this is actually the most troubled part of uh, the balance sheet. Think about when we're talking about commercial mortgages, think about uh, a mortgage on office building or apartment building or on a big box retailer, or on restaurants, or hotels, or sports arenas. Those are commercial mortgages, and life insurance companies have traditionally invested in those safe and predictable assets. But as we think about businesses not paying rent to the owners of those properties, and them in turn perhaps being late on mortgage payments or even defaulting on mortgage payments, that is going to have an impact on what life insurance companies earn on their general account. It's going to have an impact on what they have to reserve. And ultimately, it reflects in the products that life insurance companies manufacture, 
whether it's what they create in a new product or what they can credit to policyholders. Now, this next topic is a little bit technical, but really important for life insurance professionals to understand. It's reserving. So uh, life insurance companies have to set up reserves because things like this financial crisis happen and not all mortgages pay all of their payments on time or not all bonds go to maturity and pay off principal. So there is under the NAIC's risk-based capital uh, structure, a tiering of the assets. More risky assets the insurance company has to put greater reserves for. So let's say, and this is showing the reserves that insurance companies need for mortgages. So let's say they're taking out a mortgage on a property that is uh, lots of rent to cover debt service. The loan to value is high. So um, the loan is, is less than 85% of the value of the building. That would be the highest grade of mortgage. And uh, insurance companies came into this crisis with almost 52% of their mortgages in this category. Now for a mortgage like that, the insurance company needs to reserve 90 basis points or less than 1% of the value of that mortgage. So they'd set that up in the reserves. But let's assume that that mortgage is for a large hotel and no one has been in that hotel or occupancy is way down and the owner is late on payments. Um, that is gonna move that mortgage down in terms of quality. Now, if it's overdue 90 days, it would move all the way down into this lowest category and the reserves would go from less than 1% to somewhere between 15 and 20%. Um, so the insurance company has to set a countervailing offset for the value of that mortgage in its reserve. And uh, again, all life insurance companies have these mortgages. They've, many of them have very high quality mortgages going into this, but just about all companies are gonna have difficulty with those mortgages in this type of environment. So what can we learn Part of what we do also with uh, tracking the companies we do business with, particularly the public companies, is we have our team listen to read the first quarter earnings, look for uh, highlights of what might be going on, but also listen to the first quarter earnings calls and see what the institutional investors who follow this are asking about the companies. So at this point, we now have first quarter earnings reports from the public companies, Manulife, John Hancock, Principal, Equitable, Lincoln, and Prudential. Um, so what did we learn from these? Uh, clearly, investors are concerned about asset quality. There are some bright spots. Uh, there were a lot of questions about how will COVID-19 impact mortality? And the consistent answer across all these carriers is it will be relatively minor, uh, less than $100 million, of $100 million, even for the largest companies. And it will probably be something that after 2020 has an even smaller impact. The longer term impact and the focus of many of the calls was the write down for assets, whether it's bonds or mortgages, and what we also see is uh, what companies are doing um, with their products. So uh, the Lincoln call was particularly instructive. Uh, Dennis Glass did, a, he's the CEO of Lincoln, very good job of answering questions. And one of the things that Lincoln is gonna be doing is writing less surplus intensive products. Think about uh, products with guarantees. He told the investors on that call that by changing product mix, he would free up $1.7 billion of capital by writing less in product intensive or surplus intensive products. Um, the uh, uh, call with principal, uh, there were questions, they have a higher degree of mortgages than some of the other companies, um, but principal assured 
the investors very little exposure to the hotel industry. So uh, less concern, but the analysts ask questions and uh, you get a response. Uh, everybody did talk about product changes. Um, we saw the Wall Street Journal article where Valmark was quoted where products are changing and particularly products with guarantees and the general account are gonna change the most. Uh, variable products are gonna change the least and really be the product of choice for the next probably couple of years as insurance companies don't have to make that difficult decision of buying very low yielding safe bonds or higher yielding bonds that might be subject to a downgrade. One of my, my favorite historical figures is a gentleman named Andrew Carnegie, uh, the founder of US Steel. And Andrew Carnegie said, the older I get, the more attention I pay to what people do instead of what they say. So an interesting thing that uh, I noticed in the first quarter is the stronger insurance companies have issued a considerable amount of debt. Actually, there was a report today in the first quarter, uh, the US life industry issued more debt in the first quarter than they typically would in almost three quarters of uh, a total year. So a large amount of debt issued. Now we can learn some things from that debt. And this is again, one of the things that we look at as we look at companies. Um, one of the things is if an institutional investors who really have looked much more carefully than any individual investor at the risk profile of a life insurance company are willing to give that insurance company very large amounts of debt and not expect repayment for 30 years that really gives us confidence that uh, those companies are in good shape. And I look at the companies issuing the debt, they are doing this really in anticipation of write downs that they're gonna have to take on bonds and mortgages that are in their portfolio. So let's look at what's happened just uh, really since the crisis. I put up here on the screen, a number of uh, publicly traded and um, also some mutual companies that have uh, issued a significant amount of debt. And let's maybe start with the largest of them. New York Life issued 2.5 billion of new surplus notes. Now these surplus notes trade just with institutional investors and they're treated as equity uh, in terms of risk-based capital, but they really look like debt. It's a fixed instrument that's paid uh, the interest is paid annually with maturity paid at the end. And the reason it's treated as equity is these claims sit behind claims of policyholders in the event that there was an insolvency. So if policyholders, uh, company goes into receivership and there's a, a $10 billion of policyholder liabilities, those all get paid dollar for dollar before any surplus notes get paid. And look at the, the rate here. Uh, we're talking about a 30 year instrument uh, maturing in 2050 and the coupon for that 30 years is 3.75%. Uh, that should have us feeling very, very good about New York life. You can see also some of the other large mutuals, Guardian and Mass Mutual issued surplus notes on similar terms. Uh, in smaller denominations, but uh, on similar terms. We also saw um, Prudential issue a series of notes. Um, they issued some uh, additional notes earlier in the year, but post-crisis, $1.5 billion of additional debt due in 2026, 2030, and 2040 uh, at rates ranging from one57 uh, up to 3%. Now, again, little shorter duration, little lower rate, but very attractive terms. And again, a sign of uh, high confidence by investors. Manulife, which is the parent company of John Hancock, issued $2 billion of notes 
due in 2030 and 2035. Now, these are variable uh, rate notes or floating rates versus the fixed rates for the other companies that we looked at, but 2.2 to 2.8%, again, uh, sign of high confidence in the company that uh, giving them money for this period of time. AIG, uh, now this is up at the holding group level, issued uh, $4 billion of notes, uh, due anywhere from 2025 to 2050, on terms of two and a half to up to 4.37%. Now that would be for all of their companies, whether it's PNC or life companies. Um, and uh, Lincoln, uh, just this month here in May, issued $800 million of additional debt, some of it due in 2050, some of it due in 2030. The 2050 notes are at 4.38%, so slightly higher rate than the large AAA mutuals, but still a very, very competitive rate and consistent with uh, high confidence in um, lending the company money over a longer period of time. Now, uh, right before we recorded this last week, Bright House issued $500 million of notes. These are 10-year notes, as opposed to some of the 30-year notes uh, due in 2030. And uh, they are paying 5.625%. Now let's compare that with uh, a similar term. So we also have some notes that AIG issued that are 10-year notes at 3.4. We have some uh, prudential notes that were issued on similar terms that are 2.12. And we have some Lincoln notes that uh, were issued at 3.42. Now, if we compare that specifically to the prudential note, investors are demanding approximately a 350 basis point higher rate to lend money to Bright House over a similar period that they would uh, lend that money to Prudential. Um, that's what we call in the investment business a risk premium. Um, but these are some things that tell us what is going on with the companies. So I think for these companies, these are it is positive that they were able to float debt. That is very different than the last uh, financial crisis. Um, but it also tells us uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes in a, one of his mysteries said, well, how did you know that this uh, crime didn't happen? He said, it is the dog that did not bark. And we can look at these carriers and see that they've been able to issue notes very recently on favorable terms. Um, a number of companies have not issued additional debt. Now, that might mean they don't need it. It may mean that they are maxed out with surplus notes if they are a mutual company. It may mean that they cannot obtain debt on reasonable terms at this point. That's the part that we may not know and we need to keep watching. So um, what does this mean for life insurance professionals who are trying to help their clients make good decisions? Um, what can you expect? And unfortunately, I think we do need to expect downgrades for the industry. Uh, it will be impossible for life insurance companies owning lots of bonds and mortgages not to see uh, those bonds and mortgages downgraded and perhaps some defaults. Um, I think it means we need to be more selective about the companies we do business with. I've just shared some things that should make us all feel better about the companies that we've looked at here. But uh, just saying, oh, so-and-so has this great product and their annuity rate is a little bit higher without knowing more about them, we may not be acting in clients' best interest. We need to really know more about the companies we do business with because this is a, a turbulent time. We've talked a lot with our Life insurance 10x, one, one element is selecting the right companies, 
But a second element is carefully configuring the product and understanding how it works. So I would say, um, as we look at configuring illustrations and making recommendations, it makes sense to look at products that don't allow the insurance companies to pass on the pain of lower yields and the potential of uh, defaults on bonds and mortgages, which again translate to lower yields, to policyholders. Uh, for many of you, that means guarantees. It can also mean separate account products where um, instead of passing on a lower crediting rate or cap, the consumer gets whatever those equities or bonds have returned less a spread that's fully disclosed. The Wall Street Journal article that was published last week talked about guarantees are getting more expensive, companies are repricing. So at Valmark, we're really seeing advisors locking up those, those more favorable pricing. And the Valmark um, policyholders that were featured in the article were ju doing just that. They were um, obtaining prices before they go up. And then finally, um, our sales have been gravitating more and more towards variable, particularly over the last 10 years as interest rates have fallen. And I think that's gonna be even more true. We're seeing premium limits, uh, limits on amounts of 1035s that are coming over. Um, variable products are going to be the products of the future, particularly for high net worth clients. So that's what, if you've got a fork in the road, uh, take it. And I would say we've identified direction that can help you do a better job of serving your policyholders. I'd like to thank you for watching us today and what is my first LinkedIn video. I hope you found it beneficial. If you're interested in any of the materials that uh, we've shown, we'd be glad to share them with you. And I look forward to talking to you in the future.